we go. Let's see here. What can we do to to introduce what it is we're doing? And the first thing I can do is figure out how to get us on screen, which should be that and that. that. And for some reason, it is not showing us up. What is going on here today? All right. We are on air, though, Andy, so they can hear us right now, at least. But why on earth is that? Attic? There we go. We get rid of that. We get rid of that. that. Oh, there it is. Why? There it is. Ha! <laughs> Sorry about that, Andy. I have uh, done some real uh, interesting things trying to get this all set up here. Um, let's see here. How about a side by side here? I think I got there a little more than you go. It looks like you went back to uh, the beginning of COVID as well. And uh, I still am hopeful that I will win Mr. COVID hair by the time this thing's over. But I think my Chris, mine was wife wants that, me to get a hair. was about that long in August. And in August, the new hairstylist when I moved to Vegas took went just a little too high. So we're working on getting it back and catching up with the Chris, Chris Luck. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hi, everyone. Chris Hewer. Um, I'm very fortunate to be joined today by a dear old friend and colleague, Andy Abramson. Uh, I can't even, I was trying to remember where we met and I'm thinking like, I know late nineties somewhere, maybe DC or Vegas or Javits. I, I can't even remember. It's been Definitely so long. Javits, probably. Definitely Javits, maybe CES, maybe one of the many events, maybe a party I threw. I mean, you and I both, we have the gray hair hidden somewhere to, I can see it in your beard, but we both have the gray hair somewhere that we're not new. We're not somebody who just came out of Stanford or Berkeley or Harvard and walked in with a pretty little PowerPoint and a big smile and a GPA and worked our way through the internet world. We've been around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, I, I always cite back to, um, you know, one of my favorite early T-shirts uh, was BB Edit. It I remember well, uh, BB Edit. I can also remember D-Base. Oh, oh. You know, my wife actually worked for Gupta, speaking of databases yeah. and all that. She was the right hand of the CEO for a while. So, uh, anyways, really tech. But we're here today because um, Andy joined us on a clubhouse night where I was talking to a bunch of people, all these conflicting reports coming out about whether or not remote work was more productive or less productive. And it really seemed to me that the uh, sort of same track has been followed with remote work productivity as with coffee and red wine and chocolate. One day it's great for you, the next day eh, studies are different. Um, and my hypothesis was that it depends on the situation and it depends on the people. And Andy jumped in and reminded me of his very long of working remotely. So we decided to get together and have a chat, get some of it recorded and be able to extract some pearls of wisdom from his experience and uh, share some more with you. Uh, if you are here live, I don't expect a big live audience, by the way, because there's not a lot of promotion for it up front. And people don't join this stuff live when they can watch it later at their own leisure, which kind of sucks. But we'll uh, we'll get that sorted. But uh, I got a bunch of questions for you, Andy. Why don't you, first of all, just for the sake of our introduction and getting this into the podcast, please introduce yourself and a little bit of your background so other people can get to know you a little bit better like I do. So I won't do the new style clubhouse introduction that I started, which is, hi, I'm Andy, read my bio. I make wine and own two marketing agencies. Uh, but I really do make wine and own two marketing agencies. Uh, one's called Communicano. We've been around since 1993. Uh, we've done now 54 exits in the last 19 years for 5.5 billion with a B, like billionaire Bill Gates. Uh, the more impressive than the number or the amount of money raised, I would say, is that Google's bought two of the companies, Grand Central, which is now known as Google Voice, and Gips, which is Global IP Solutions, which is all of the underpinnings of the likes of Google Meet and Google Duo and a lot of the other stuff that you're starting to see in Google Voice and in Google Fi. That, hey, Alexa, stop. So now we've got Alexa <laughs> thinking she's part. Alexa wants to be on the air. Yes. And then we've got, um, we've also had two companies acquired by Vonage, uh, Simple Signal and Telesphere. But more importantly, eBay acquired StubHub and uh, Computer Associates acquired Arcot Systems, which provides all of the verified by Visa and 3D secure MasterCard transactions. Uh, 
we've had one, uh, Lotus, uh, same time by IBM was Web Dialogues, and the list goes on and on and on with Cisco and Symantec and Logitech and Citrix. If you use GoToMeeting that Citrix owned for a while, it was originally called High Def Conferencing. And those are some of the companies that came through our doors along with the likes of AOL and AT&T. We don't count their exits in the number. And Nokia, we don't count that one when we launched the Nokia Blogger Relations Program. I have a second agency called Brand Communication Design, which is a partnership with my longtime colleague, Rod Ige. Rod and I grew up inside the Footcomb Belding uh, system of advertising mm -hmm. agencies when FCB was number six or seven. We were part of the impact team out of Los Angeles. And then throughout the years, We've teamed up um, getting one product named number two best new product at CES back in 2010. That was AT&T's Cruisecast. So Rod and I created another agency called Brand Communication Design, and we're all about building the brand from the design stage all the way through to the execution. And we say design, we don't just mean free little pictures any more than public relations is simply about publicity. Um, I've been in the event world. I've recently started a third company with my partner Victoria called Wine Toria, and we're all about the discovery of new wines in undiscovered wine regions. And we're rolling that out over the next few months. So kind of I'm in the wine world, I'm in the tech world, I'm in the design and business building world, but most of all, I'm in the fun world. And you would never believe it for a guy who grew up working in pro sports from the time he was 14 till he was 38. So I constantly say I'm a reformed sports marketing executive. I still obviously bleed flyer orange, who I worked for and retired Bobby Clark and have the poster on the wall to prove it. So that's my history in two minutes or less. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, uh, th thank you so much for, for sharing all that. Uh, it is just uh, phenomenal to be able to talk to you more about this. And I'm trying to figure out, there we go. All right. I'm trying to get used to my new UI on this wonderful thing. So apologies on my tech challenges. Um, you know, it occurs to me that when you started the blogger relations program with Nokia, I, I had already recognized your name from prior meetings at conferences and seeing you speak and everything. But I think what was really interesting about our conversation the other day, and of course the reason for this in here, is that you helped to manage all of those exits from anywhere you were around the world, whether in a hotel, whether at your house, but you decided very early in your career never to have an office. Can you, can you explain why you made that choice back in, was it mid to late 90s? So I think, I, first of all, I created Communicano in 1992, 93, after Upper Deck summarily fired all of us for building the business from $27 million a year in revenue to $293 million in 18 months. I decided that I was going to have my own business. And I didn't even think about having an office. I took a part of my house and turned it. But in reality, I've been working remotely or anywhere. And I started a blog called Working Anywhere, which I kind of laid off doing in 2005. I think I ran it for about three or four years, but I always had VoIP Watch, which was always my main voice. The idea of working anywhere started probably when I was 14 and working for the Philadelphia Wings when Ed Tepper hired me. And I went from stuffing tickets to stuffing news releases. And that was how I broke into the PR world, but really was working with reporters in their offices, working with them in the press box, traveling with the team on the road, phoning in the scores every period to different media outlets. And then as time went on over the, you know, the next couple of years, you learn to work from your hotel room, the press box, the press room, even, you know, phone booths at the airport. Remember when we had phone booths. So you, that was first. Then when I went to work for the Philadelphia Flyers in 76, the reality was that I would go from high school to the office. I was in 10th grade at the time. I'd take three buses to get, and I got my dad's car finally to drive, but I would drive to the office and work from there. And then I would go to high school hockey games at night and work from there, phoning in the scores. Then I would get home and I would take the rest of the information off of a recording device that all the game announcers had phoned in from all the different ice rinks in the Philadelphia area. So I was working from home. I was working from the rinks. I was working in the office. I was working from school. And that just continued. And even when I went to work for Upper Deck, I was the one of the road warriors because every other Thursday night, I was on a red eye somewhere to watch a Heroes of Baseball game on the weekend that we were sponsoring or to do meetings in New York or meetings in Philadelphia or whatever we were. I was negotiating all the sports marketing deals. So my travel days were Thursday night, red eye, come back Monday night, be in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 
home for the weekend and then again the next Thursday. So that was kind of like a routine I started. And I think I took 18 red eyes in, in 12 months at one point, which is crazy. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think what's interesting about what you point out is how many people have already been working remotely in similar situations. Um, in fact, when I was talking with Steve Gilmore a few months back before we got all this stuff launched, he thought that, and it was right, of course, as he often is, that I should focus on understanding media and that predict newsrooms in terms of deadline-based journalism and how do they create that accountability system and everything else. And, you know, for some reason, I didn't even think about sports, the other side of it, but surely that was it. And so well, you have a very interesting story about uh, the accountability component as well that I've read and heard you share before, but how, how was the accountability kind of managed in this system where you're, you know, running around these stadiums and in phone booths and everything else? How did the things happen as they were supposed to happen? Thank God for an AT&T calling card back then. But, um, and until the cell, I had the first cell phone, the year Metrophone came to Philadelphia in 1984, 85. Uh, I was one of the first people to buy a cell phone. And I switched from the back, the phone was hardwired in my car to a techno phone out of the UK. It was the first portable phone and long before, then the flip phone eventually. Accountability was um, pretty easy and straightforward. You were talking to people on the phone, telling them what you were doing. And you would check in with different people. Uh, with, the, with the arrival of the PBX, when I was working for the Flyers, one of the things I was responsible for was putting the first modern day PBX into an arena and a sports team with a System 75 wow. at and But what I would do is... I, my team and i had three or four people working for me by the time i left the flyers in 88 i would dial into the office talk to the secretary find out all the people who had called for me get those numbers write them down on a pad or put them into some kind of personal organizer had just started to come to life i remember having a sharp personal organizer in the 80s oh yeah and then i would talk to the other two or three people who worked for me in the office then i would hang up i would call my board of director people i would talk to every couple of days I would call my chief coach who had a job as controller of the University of Pennsylvania by day and hockey coach by night for the youth hockey programs we ran. And, and you, I had a routine of checking in the people. And, and what, was, what I also had was this priority system of who got called when. So external people got called first, internal people got called second, family got called third. And it was just, I, I used that type of priority system of how I would stay in touch with people because even though a few of us were on MCI mail or CompuServe back in the eighties, yeah. the rest of the world wasn't. So yeah. there was no email, there was no text messaging. And those of us who had a cell phone were lucky because we were able to graduate from the calling card to the cell phone. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I'm trying to remember my CompuServe ID, 79853764, something like that, right? 72245,534, and I even can remember my password. Oh my God. Oh my God. Well, like, it's really I can't remember my ICQ number though. Oh God. I, I I don't even, yeah. I was only on that briefly before I got onto something else. AOL. And AIM. No, I, I got to, well, of course we all use AOL messenger in the early days, but then I would aim, was it aim the cross platform one? No, that well, I aim, don't was, but aim was what eventually became cross platform. The thing was that yeah. had they really let Justin Frankel do what he was doing with waste, and I got into a big yes. argument with the AOL, AOL brought me in to speak one day at a conference and I was supposed to be the, the contrarian. And I said, well, you guys really screwed it up because you had, you could have been owned the Skype market and the MP3 market. If you had just let Justin do what he wanted to do with waste and the product managers from aim were like, how dare you? You don't know the backstory. And I go, there is no backstory. The backstory is <laughs> I didn't let him do it because you were better at politics than he was. And they just, oh, it was, it was a funny, it was a funny lunchtime. But to your yeah. question about the Nokia era, I had already been working by the time we launched the Nokia Blogger Relations Program in 2005 remotely for, you know, since 74. But the agency had been running remotely since 2000, uh, since 93. And when Martin Geddes one morning had sent me a chat message, he was with the head of worldwide communications for Nokia at the executive team at the executive committee level. And they had a problem. They wanted to amplify their smartphones in North America because they had absolutely no distribution at all. Like, and, and reviews around Nokia products in the 2004, 2005 era consisted of Nokia has released the model such and such price point is, and it's available from. And that was, that was the sum total of what they were getting.
from a review standpoint and what they're getting from any type of third party influencing. So uh, R uh, Rico Vonanen, who was the head of communications, was on the phone with, with Martin the next day. And I presented what I had put together in a chat session with Martin over Skype that morning, the day before, at my then to be wife's house in Sacramento. And I quickly just cut and pasted that, that chat and then cleaned it up. I didn't even put a price tag on the program because I hadn't thought that. <laughs> the call ended with Andy, send me a contract. I said, we don't have a budget number. He goes, put whatever you want in. This is the most mind blowing concept we've ever heard. And believe me, he goes, we've tried two other concepts internally that he goes, I won't even show you how bad they were they, compared to what you presented. <laughs> so we put, the product, we put it together. They signed the contract 90 days later because Nokia moves in quarters. And then as we're getting ready to go on press, this is now like month seven into the deal, and I still haven't gotten my first payment. I'm like, this doesn't happen if you don't wire me the money right now. So in comes this big wire for, I don't know, $90,000, which 60 of it went to printing because we printed all the materials at once the last four years because we knew this was a big, I said, do you want to print for one year or do you want to print for four years? And I showed him the price. He goes, print for four. So we printed for four years and all this stuff sat in my, um, in my house and, and, and I had in the garage down in boxed up stuff and we started to ship out phones and you're talking about working anywhere and the ability to do things. So it was Thanksgiving weekend of 2005 when we launched this and I was on a plane to Munich, Germany and I flew Lufthansa, which if those of you who are old enough to know, um, GoGo was not the world's first in-flight Wi-Fi. It was Boeing systems, and Boeing had the connection, and they were on Lufthansa airplanes and JAL airplanes. So here I am in business class flying over, and the program launches. And three or four key influencers caught wind of the program. Ohm Malik, back then with GigaOhm. Yeah. Uh, another guy who I should remember his name, from Atlanta, who I knew for years from the old days of the ENA, and the name will eventually come to me. And one other person in New York, plus PR Week, somehow picked up Ohm's tweet, or not Ohm's tweet, but Ohm's post. And all of a sudden, I'm getting calls from my IT guy, Greg Trinidad, Andy, you're blowing out the server at Vario. Nice. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, the traffic is insane, and it's so big, you're hurting my other client's traffic as well <laughs> as one of your other client's traffic. We, we just put a bunch of uh, uh, handcuffed sweatshirts on sale for my friend Marshall. And it was so much traffic was coming in for the Nokia program that nothing was happening. So we overnight, while I'm on the plane, I'm communicating with Nokia to authorize the purchase of our own server for 12 months which was going to be a certain type. We went to that one. And then Monday, the very, I'm in Frankfurt, Germany, I think, or Munich. So when I get a call from the guy at Vario, I'll never forget. He goes, Andy, I'm the person who's responsible for the, op the smooth operations of Vario. He goes, you guys are blowing us out. Even with what we moved you on to, you need to go to something else. And I'll go, are you just doing this because you want to make money? He goes, no, no, no. I can show you the stats. We had so much traffic that weekend and it continued forever and ever that the program started out as a hit and it just kept playing. Yeah, and, and, but I could have done it without being there and being connected, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, and and that's actually I'm coming back to that and and some of the other things. But as I kind of synthesize some insights out of what you did, you, you're really hitting on some really important parts. Number one is the engagement. We have to be constantly engaged. We have to really care about the work as you did, um, and not only that, but being proactive. So it's actually self initiation, which is something that you know not everyone has these days. Um, the other component is that you actually had rituals in your routines that you had set up that you would follow regularly as you were prioritizing, you know, getting hold of the external people before internal and how you ran your processes. And so you, you actually applied systems. Right? Um, and inside all of that, uh, it, you were able to focus on the number one thing that's really hurting people today, communications. How do we share the current information with people, keep people connected, keep them up to date? And now I think as we're going asynchronous, synchronous, and people are kind of facing that challenge, it's more important than ever um, to make sure that people know what we need them to know um, when we need to know it, and not just relying on them to have already read it or seen it somewhere else, but make that proactive outreach. 
So how are you applying that sort of stuff in your work life today um, as we've been going through this COVID routine and working at home? And I know you're working on launching the new wine business and everything else. So how are you actually being proactive in your current business today? So being an old event guy and sports is nothing but the event world. Every every day, every game is an event. Every And then the event is broken down into a series of micro events, whether it's how the doors open, how the doors close, when you're doing the, what announcements are happening. So you learn how to be scheduled. And because sports runs on a schedule, it's very important that you keep your schedule and you try very hard not to postpone. Postpone leads to confusion. Somebody shows up to the meeting not getting the message. It's like today, we switch from one platform to the other. That switch, if someone wasn't as adept at staying in touch of all their different messages, they would think they were gonna be on Zoom, not on Restream. So the, the reality is that you have to be able to stay on top of your communication first. And if you're not connected, and when Ken Rakowski and I did the World Tech Roundup, we used to always end it with the phrase, stay connected. You have to stay connected. I am constantly traveling with my iPhone. Today for an appointment out of the house, I took my iPad and I had my, my earbuds with me. And then of course in the car, I'm connected via Bluetooth. Being able to stay aware and alert, and that was how I got your update to where we we're going to be. So it was no big deal at switching over. I knew it was happening even before I got back to the house. So first is stay connected. Second is set some type of a routine. And when I say set some type of a routine, that doesn't mean be so physically locked in that you're inflexible. You have to have a little bit of flexibility. But what I do is I set up on my calendar that I can't take phone calls between 7 o'clock in the morning and 9 a.m. as a rule. Now, does that mean I don't have calls or conference calls at that hour? Absolutely not. But those two hours are my two hours to control what I like to refer to as my time. It's the same thing that Woven does in their calendar scheduling service. They call it my time because you can bring things in. So that's the very first thing is control your time. Second is I really work hard to group my calls together back to back with about a five to 10 minute buffer in between. What that allows me to do is go through the important messages that have come in, review text messages, emails, check voicemail if necessary. Most people don't leave voicemail messages anymore though, thank God. In the old days of Upper Deck, my voice mailbox would have 120 messages new every day that some yep. secretary would literally trans hand write and then fax them to me wherever I was. Um, the, the third thing is have time for you time, meaning when you're going to write, when you're going to correspond, when you're going to take care of that personal matter that you know you have to take care of, that if you don't take care of during the work day, you're not going to get it taken care of because those people you have to call only work during work hours which is why it's great to be an entrepreneur and employed by uh, and work, work in your own business because you can go get your hair cut, go get your tires changed, go get a new suit. You know, everything is pre-COVID type of thinking. But with COVID, what we're finding is there's greater invasion into your day on the hours of your day. So instead of a seven to six o'clock day, I'm going six in the morning till seven at night. And then I'm not getting my social time at night that I used to go out at the end. I would work that whole 12 hours in my house, just as I always did, maybe do a midday run somewhere, get something in. But I would then use my nighttime as social time. That's when I would go out, see friends. I never do lunch meetings with friends. That's another rule. Don't lunch is for business or lunch is for you, but don't be seeing your friends at lunch who have nothing better to do. You're here to work. And if you're a remote worker, that means setting boundaries. And one of the boundaries I set a long time ago is I don't do lunch meetings with friends. Clients, mm -hmm. yes. Friends, no. Unless they're coming in from out of town. That's a slightly different type of story. Yeah. But if someone's in the neighborhood, meet me for breakfast or meet me for dinner, but never lunch. Because you don't know if that lunch hour is the hour you need to make up for something that caused you to run long in the morning or to prep for the afternoon. That's the third boundary. And the fourth boundary is know what your technology can do and can't do. And when you hit a technology ceiling or a, a hard limit with technology, it's time to find something better. So I really I really love that you're getting in the boundaries. That's something that we're very interested in as well. In fact, there's the other boundary, which is the boundary of space. So I remember when uh, you know Small Business Opportunity Magazine and those guys came out and they started talking about the home office with the RIC as I was coming out of college. 
And the idea of having a dedicated space was really all the rage. And of course, you know, people didn't have that. And that's been the, one of the big things that people facing the new to work from home ha have run into is how to establish those boundaries. And of course, the boundaries with your spouse and with your kids, hard to see with your pets sometime. But what, what do you do? I mean, right now, it looks like you're working in the kitchen right now. And I see you got some of your wines behind you there. Uh, so how do you go about setting the boundaries in your space, Alexa notwithstanding? So going back to my early days at sports, I was 14. I was living with my parents. I had my bedroom upstairs. And I basically told my mom and dad when the doors closed, because I never slept with my door closed as a kid. It was always wide open. Even at night when I go to sleep, the door would open. But if I'm up there and my door is closed, it's as if I'm not there. And I set that boundary at a very young age at 14. And the idea was that I, even if I hadn't eaten dinner and mom was going to come up and bring me something to eat, you don't know if I'm on a phone call. You don't know what I'm doing, but I'm working. And that was the very first thing was I said, if the door is closed. And I learned that because I learned the idea that working at the office of Philadelphia Wings, if somebody had an office door closed, you don't go in unless you have an appointment. Yeah. So the closed door was the very first thing that, that happened. But, you know, with the housing, the way people have started to work in a, a great room environment or a, or an open room environment, or they've never worked from home, especially with spouses and kids and kids more than spouses. Cause you can explain to an adult that this is work time. Yeah. Get over it. Unless, unless your partner is needy or something like that, then it's kind of hard. And I've seen that happen too many times, but you have to teach the kids. This is work time for dad or mom. And the fact that they're home and working with a headset or they've got their computer open, that's work. And you have to wait until they close their computer or take their headset off. And you can sit there and listen and learn, but you can't have the conversation with mom or dad until they're done. Now, I can relate that to as I was growing up in the Philadelphia Flyers organization, the person I reported to his name was Aaron Siegel. And Aaron was one of my, I refer to in business, one of my four business dads that I had in life men who took me under their wing and mentored me because I started working again when I was 14. So what would happen is I would go by Aaron's office and I had a real good relationship with his secretary, Pat, and she would say, go on in. He's on a call, but he'll be done in 15 minutes. And he would go like this and, and then he would point to his chair or the chair on the couch or the couch and he would just sit down and I would listen. And those were business calls he was having. And those were business calls that though they did not directly involved me, they ultimately at some point affected me. Mm. And I would learn. I would learn who he was talking to. I would learn what the discussion was about. He would then explain to me what I just heard, not to repeat it to others, but so I understood it. That was part of my business growth and development. And I was fortunate as I worked it, my way through different companies, even though it was when I was at Denver Nuggets with John Gardner, may he rest in peace in the late Sydney Schlenker, I had that kind of rapport with them, Andy Schlenker also, where we didn't, they didn't keep me in the dark. Instead, they were inclusive of things that I needed to know and to learn about. So if you treat your children that way at a young age, they will learn from you if you have that type of mentoring gene that Thankfully, all of my second dads in life, and I had four of them, and they were great, and three, and uh, one still alive, Aaron, the other three have passed, along with my dad. But having that kind of mentor relationship with your child, I hope to be able to do that with my son, who turns six next month. And, and though he doesn't live with me, as he gets older, I want to have that exact kind of mentoring role with him, so, because the world has changed, and to be good with younger people means to mentor and educate not simply tell yes and no. Yeah, you know, that's such an important commitment. And now, of course, there are new employees at large companies across the country who have never been on campus, who, who don't have the chance to learn all the things we did from sitting across from a mentor and listening in on the phone call and getting that sort of debrief through the osmosis and the direct interaction. So I'm wondering, um, how you think that's going to move forward for how we can recreate that sort of knowledge transfer, you know, for all these people who may never go and work in an office like we did. Any thoughts on how we might be able to look forward to create something new for them? I'm genuinely concerned about that exact 
scenario because I've seen too many times where um, the work the those who are entering the workforce who have no real work experience or who have had experience in service industry jobs as opposed to knowledge worker jobs. So if you think about how somebody goes and becomes a consultant for Accenture or, or Deloitte or any of the large consulting firms, Boston Consulting Group, uh, all the way up to McKinsey, you're put onto a team when you graduate out of college or graduate out of business school. And you're expected to work 12 to 14 hours a day, do all the grunt work, yes, get coffee, you know, make the reservations, figure out how everybody's getting to the airport and do all the crunch work. And yet as you're doing that, you're also going to corporate dinners, corporate meetings where you're expected to take the notes, do the research, and then go in and meet with the team or the team leader or the department chair or whoever it is, the practice lead, and give them your thoughts based on what you've researched, what you've learned, what you know. And if you start to show potential, you move from being that assistant, for lack of a better word, assistant product manager, a junior consultant to a consultant role to a lead consultant over a series of five to 10 years. Just like lawyers do, where you go from being a you know the associate to being full-term legal to a partner. All this happens over time. But the best ones were the ones who learned the soft social skills, how to entertain a client, how to make a reservation, where to go, how to bring the right flowers if you're invited to somebody's house, understanding culture and customs if you're doing business internationally. And you don't just learn that from a book or by reading it or watching a YouTube video, as many people think, you mm -hmm. only learn it by practicing it in, in, as I say, playing the game. And life is the game we play, which was a line in an Oasis song. And I always love that line and always talk about it because I look at life as a game. I, I've had fun, Chris, since the time I'm 14. I've never had a day where I didn't have a paycheck or something to work on since then and or a business and the reason that i look at it as i've had fun i haven't worked a single day in my life is i learned some of those soft social skills from people i got to apply them but so i'm very concerned about the soft skills that executives learn because i'm already seeing that and and i'm not going to paint all young workers just out of college up to the millennial age in the same bucket and this isn't ego talking most of them have a hard time writing and speaking mm. and that's the and that ultimately <clears throat> excuse me, as we look at it you know and as we discussed before the, that communication skills is still paramount and in fact one of the first things i learned from uh, mrs hartney my high school business teacher was that the top skill uh, required of executives was improved communications. And now more than ever, given the fact that we lose our uh, body language and some of the other little things we pick up from being in person with one another, we have to be crisper and more concise. And actually, as I found over the past year, what's also important with the remote stuff is setting the context appropriately. It's not just about the information and the action, but how we set that up so that the person receive it can know what we're expecting and what needs to be done with it properly. Um, and that, that way we can avoid a lot of confusion. And what I'm finding is that we spend probably, you know, at least a minute and a half, if not two minutes of preparation of our thoughts for every minute we wanna be presenting or sharing to somebody some of these issues. How should we started thinking about that now? Um, I try and jump on phone calls and video calls and be able to try work to recreate the in-person experience as much as possible i've always been good on the phone i've always been able to close clients on the phone and present an idea and talk through it maybe talking a little long um if anything uh, so i've been working on talking shorter and more crisper but i i think that video is the next step and we all have to learn how to be better presenters and to use video I think most of the video that we have today is poorly produced and has no production value. And it, if we're really going to make video the, the way that people are communicating, whether it's on a giant widescreen or whether it's on a tiny you know, iPhone, I think it's important that people learn to master the art of video communication and the ability to put their thoughts together 
not everybody is like you or I. We're both probably very good on our feet. We've been doing it for years. There isn't a question that I've had anybody throw at me other than when they asked it to me in French when I was getting married in 2007 in the middle of the vineyard. And they were firing questions to me in French. And I had to actually do the translation in my head because I don't speak fluent French to understand what they were trying to get me to say so I could do more than just smile and look stupid. So that was probably the most that was like the most challenging interview I ever had in my life was when the French reporters from the Montpellier TV station came out to cover our wedding. Oh and here I am, I've trained people on how to deal with the media, but the one thing I never dealt with was dealing with foreign media. Yeah, yeah, and thinking on your feet is such a thing. And I, I know a lot of people, and particularly part of it is because you and I had very early opportunities to do that. So we got yeah. through the nerves, we got through the kind of projection of like, oh, that person on TV that's so special and crazy and started like just being, no, it's about being here and being present. Uh, the other day though, one of my uh, friends brought up the point, actually John Bates, he's doing a new workshop around leadership. He's been consulting uh, and coaching TED speakers and TEDx speakers for some time. But what he pointed out, and I think this is really important for helping more senior executives on that, that today's leadership presence is your telepresence. So how we show up with good lighting, with good sound, with not overly busy background, but maybe sharing a little of ourselves. Of course, we've got Room Raider out there now and all this other stuff, um, but, but really important point. Um, but I wanna go back actually and wrap those last two together because it occurs to me that while we're talking about the need for mentorship and how it's changing now that we're remote and people won't be in an office, you've had people working for you for decades who were never in the same office with you. Now you work together on the road and stuff like that, I'm sure. But how did you actually develop the people back in the early days when the technology was still, wow, I can SMS on this little candy bar of a Nokia I've got. So what did you do to actually mentor and help them grow back in those early days? Well, first, when I started to hire people for the agency, I hired people better than me, who were smarter, who had more experience, who were, uh, who'd manage large teams or run agencies or been part of large companies who are really good writers, really good publicists, really good ad people, really good copywriters, really good designers. So the first thing is learn to hire people who are smarter than you. And then the technology stuff, we just forced them to use. Like, you know, literally, I'm a techie. I've been doing this tech stuff. I was online in 1981 on CompuServe and Source and Party and was part of the ENA. And if you can find ENA archives, you can find stuff I wrote in 1985. So the reality is, you know, and granted, I started when I was really young. So, you know, even at my age, I'm still young compared to the people from back then. I always hired people who were smart. That was the first thing. And then the second thing was literally we forced them to use the technology. The third thing we did was we started to use Skype in the mid 2000s as our digital water cooler. You talk about people not even being in the same office. We had people not even in the same time zones. We crossed all in our heyday with 30 employees, we had people in all four US time zones, and I probably would have had somebody in Hawaii if you asked me. Uh, and I was constantly working all over the world, so there was never a, an issue of geography standing in the way of us doing business. Um, the second thing is that we, would, we were very quick to move off of traditional tools and started to use programs like Basecamp early on in Basecamp 1's history, and then Basecamp 2 eventually because we felt that things like Microsoft Office were too limiting. Yes. I, moved in, I moved into the Google world myself in 2007, and in 2011 made the decision that come 2012, we were off of a server-based Outlook, you know, what was it? Microsoft Exchange platform, and we were moving to Google, partially because with 30-some employees and multiple additional accounts, the cost per month to use an exchange server was more than what I would pay per year for core Google G Suite back then, whatever they called yeah. it. So that was an economic decision in 2011 to switch. I had everybody except one person who still wanted to use Outlook and the only person in the history who ever got a virus in our company on their computer was a person <laughs> still using Outlook. Uh, and they were doing it because their client wanted her to communicate with them using Outlook calendar items. And anyway, what? The bottom line is we moved, We were constantly leading on the tools we were using 
and I can go back to my days with SiteSpeed as a client, and we were always insistent we would use SiteSpeed when we were talking to reporters. And because I've always felt that no matter what product you're representing, use the product. So if it was Grand Central, I was calling over my Grand Central number. If it was Talk Plus, I was using Talk Plus. If it was IOTA, we were using their conferencing app. If it was um, High Def Conferencing that became Go to Meeting, we were using you know Ben Lilienthal's High Def Conferencing. And we were always the first. Like why I still use Uber Conference? Well, first, Craig Walker is a friend. Second, I've consulted to Dialpad on three different occasions over the last 10 years. And I just believe in the product. I also own a little bit of the company. So I, I think that using what you're proud of and you know works is important, but also being religious about your own technology is very key. But we were constantly using the tools that were about to become big next. So like when people started saying, oh, we have to do Zoom calls, Zoom's been around for me for half a dozen years. I've had my, I've been paying the bill. And we play with all the different services because in our industry, you have to be conversant with them and eat what you kill. You can't just kill it. Yeah, that's really important. You know, one of the things I noticed and you brought up in an interview you did the other day in an article that I'll share in the follow-up uh, of five things or five issues with remote working with teams, um, this similar sort of concept here. Uh, but I, oh, I'm sorry, but you were talking about one minute manager, which was actually really important for me as well. In fact, um, in the, mid nineties, I started teaching uh, people twice my age, I was about 24 at the time, 23, 24, at least twice my age, sometimes older, how to run businesses, having never run a business myself. And one minute manager was one of the things that I really leaned on. But the other one that comes to mind as you were talking about, you know, using your client's products was Mark McCormick's book, but they still don't teach business school. And that right. was I remember that. important to me. And it's like, yeah, if you're going to a meeting with Avis, don't show up in a Hertz rental car, right? So like some of this stuff I did get from reading, but then I had to practically apply it to the situation that I'm in. And I still think that's one of the biggest challenges as we're in this sort of new era where a lot of the cultural norms and protocols that we're used to, you know, are shifting. And we don't know they're gonna exactly shift, but to your point, it's gonna be facilitated through technology somehow. So how do we meet our clients and meet our collaborators on that same technology platform is really important. What I'm wondering is, in particular with your client work, um, were you just kind of by necessity using that Outlook mail because your client wanted it? I know in the case you mentioned that wasn't the case, but like when you're doing a base camp or something else, what do you do in order to bring your clients and other collaborators into it when a lot of people are like, no, 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 no new tools. I had enough tools. I don't want to learn this. Ugh. So how do you actually bring people who are reluctant into the same platform so we can have the efficiency of communications that makes us more effective? Bill them more. Ah. <laughs> okay, there's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the flippant answer. No, I once had a client who just refused to use the technology and we lost them as a client. But the reason, you know, we've gone through it. I had a client named Bob Cox, who was a former Booz Allen consultant. It was my first tech, real technology client in 1995 with Mobile Word. And he was way ahead of his time. And he had this expression that I've never forgotten. He says, I've already done the math. You don't have to tell me the value of it. I know. And I, we've done the math. We've used the services. We've, you know, we've launched many of them. And we just knew it's like TruePhone was a great product that never really got finished until many years later, 10, 11 years later, it really got finished. But Google Fi is exactly what TruePhone Everywhere was supposed to be that we launched in 2009 at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, which was a single SIM card, a single rate, flat rate. You know what you're going to pay wherever you are. It, it works and connected to a local pop, so the email, but more importantly, real-time communication like we're doing today can actually work because when you were roaming, that signal would go all the way back to the HLR at your home, it's called home location um, something, HLR, home location roaming. And it would go all the way back to the server from your cell phone company. And that's why using Google Fi today is a better thing when you travel or buying a local SIM card than trying to pay AT&T or Verizon 10 bucks a day because the traffic's still going all the way to them and the pops and how fast you can run your own tests and see. But using the technology, I, I talk about you can pay us more. 
it's not really paying us more. It's it's taking more time. You know, we figured out the, the practices, whether it's Slack and Basecamp, whether it's some people like Asana, some people like Trello, I used to do is you eventually come to the, the consideration of this stuff just works and it works better. And it's like Google, Google's workspace works better than Office. Yet more companies will use Office because they've grown up on Microsoft. They're invested in Microsoft. They don't want to leave. Uh, the teams, the, the amount of changes that keep going with Teams every couple of months, if you're not using Teams every single day, you're losing track of how to do it. There's so many changes to Teams. And even Zoom is starting to suffer from feature creep too, which is another reason why I go back to Uber Conference, which as somebody said to me the other day from Europe, who came in from Germany, he goes, this is, no, Italy, this is the easiest video conferencing platform I've ever been on, all I did is click a button and I was in. So there's a, something to be said for keeping the simplicity of an app that you started with as the major tenant where you want to be all the way through. And that's why we tell our clients, we've done this. We know what works. Try it with us. And thankfully these days with things like APIs and tools like Zapier and IFTTT, we can work through the disconnects so that they can be on what they want to be on and we can be on what we want to be on. Yeah, really, really, really important consideration there is that we can now plumb these things and there is accessible middleware that you don't have to be a coder to actually utilize, which is a really big improvement. Of that. Chris, the, the best tool in the world is PySync and I'll give those guys out of Ireland a shout out. If you, are run, if you want to connect things and make it work and have it work and have it monitor this and do things in the background for you, PySync is the Swiss Army knife of conduits and connectivity. Uh, is that PySync, they've been around for 20 years. Is that the same company or is this a new or different oh, one? They've been you? around, I think, for a long time. I drift in and drift out of using it as we start to play with a new CRM system or we start to do, and it's like avoid the pain, blues, and agony. Oh, yeah. Avoid, avoid being dumped on your head from the, from the top of the ring post. <laughs> Just know, know that PySync does the job and it does it so well. And if it can't do it, then you got to go to get these guys out of San Francisco called Trey, T -R, I think it's T-R-A-Y or T-R-E-Y dot I-O. And those guys build the best uh, conduits and connectors on the planet if PySync can't do it. But then you got to spend the big bucks. Yeah, that's funny. I, I, I think I remember them from my early work helping to set up and market the Palm Economy as mm -hmm. one of the uh, apps back there, but it could be just a similar name. Hey, we're starting to run out of time, and I still got like four big questions, so I'm going to actually have to choose that down to well, two. Fire away. I'll give you short sound bites and snippets. Well, I don't know that you can on this one, but I'd love to, you to try. Um, because one of the things that has been, you know, a thread throughout our conversation so far is the idea of as entrepreneurs, um, you know, taking the initiative even to go, well, I'm going to work my day so that I can go, you know, get new tires at 10. I'll be back for the call at 12. And then after that, I'll work for a few hours. And at 3.30, I got to go get a haircut. And then I'll work from 4.35 to whatever. And we make our own day. And that requires initiative, that requires self-motivation, that requires self-management. But as you and I both know, not everyone really has that sort of gene, so to speak. So I believe it's really even more important now that even the people who don't have it find some of that in working and collaborating with others remotely. And I was just wondering over the years when you hired people in or when you work with different people, um, what you noticed about that sort of difference between the people who took initiative and those don't? And was it something you could actually, you know, teach or inspire people through your example to actually adopt? Because I think that's something we need to do today. I think to that question, it's the schedule is a schedule and the calendar is the calendar and do your best never to cancel or postpone. If you, that's the simple answer in 15 seconds, live by your schedule work your best to not cancel or postpone and respect the time of others and they'll respect you. Yeah, and actually th that's a really great way of putting actually why when we talk about boundary management, I look to the calendar as one of the chief boundary keepers. And actually, as you know, it used to be called the commitment keeper back when we had our uh, folios and, and little uh, 
planner keep the planner keepers or whatever and day runners and all that yeah. stuff yeah yeah that, that was very important component i hated them you know i had the worst handwriting i got a d in handwriting in sixth grade thank god i learned how to type at 14 because i didn't i i, I used to laugh at people who needed to carry the filofax around today my ipad and my iphone are the filofax second question uh, well, there's a few more, but I, I'm just looking down. I, I just got a new stand-up desk, and I did the whiteboard uh, desktop. And uh, you and I have a lot in common with our handwriting, at least among some of the other experiences we have. But you brought up in that article, and going back to One Minute Manager and some of the other stuff, the idea of management by walking around, um, which was really management by observation of activity, um, not necessarily by results. And of course, a couple of years ago, results-oriented work environment came out. I forget the authors, but out of Best Buy, I had a chance to interview them. And it's moving more into that space. And I think we need to move more towards that today. But still, some CEOs and, and leaders of organizations are trying to get people back to the office quicker so they can see them and that they can exert some influence on them. But how do we actually help other executives to understand that focusing on keeping commitments and delivering results is more important than seeing the activity. Is there is there any thoughts you have on that from all of your years of doing this and running around the world globally? Well, the first thing is, if you are gonna manage by walking around remotely, set a time schedule what your remote walk, walk around, your walkabout's going to be and check in with people. So as I was the road warrior for the company for many years and still probably am, the reality was that I would look at my day part, no matter what time zone I was in, and I would say, I will be calling in at this time, plan on being by the phone and not unavailable. And that would mean, even if it meant your kids doing something, just take 10 minutes not to be doing something with your kids, or don't be planning to get lunch at that time because of the, you know, the time zone difference. I might be getting ready to go to bed, and I'm really gonna need you to do these things so that when I wake up, they're sitting in my inbox. So I would set a time schedule of when I would make my calls into people. And usually it was somewhere about three or 3.30 their time, wherever, they, wherever their time was in relation to where I was. Even if it meant me getting up at three in the morning in Perth, Australia and calling them at some place in the US. So you would have your work around time. The second thing is hold people accountable. End the call by saying, and I'm gonna see this in the morning. Hold them, you know, tell them you'll see it in the morning and by the time they wake up, you'll have feedback back to them, and then you be accountable back to them by doing what you said you were going to do. And then, like right now, I have a VA I, um, I've hired through Magic, and every morning he gets up, or he, but when I wake up, he's got his text message. I don't have to look at my calendar. First thing I see on my phone is the text message from Mark telling me what my day looks like. And then he holds me accountable to do the things I owe him, and I send them right back to him. So it's about being accountable to yourself and being accountable accountable to your team. But again, growing up in the sports world, that's that's part of my DNA about you you are accountable to your teammates because you win together. If you play together, you will always win together. Re really important. And actually, I think th that's the other thing that is perhaps a difference between people who, um, well, I've been talking about it as collaborative productivity. Because I realized 20 years ago at the birth of the knowledge economy, and I know it was a little bit sooner, but when that was really emerging as the predominant paradigm over the industrial era, that the ability of smart people to work well together was the number one thing that determined value. You know, just thinking about code and chips and things like that, and what the exponential value of those solutions were, were going to be. And it still is the biggest problem. How do we set our egos and our own self to the side and focus on that common work to find alignment and mission, purpose, and objectives? As Jeremiah Owang has talked about over the years, the idea of a shared fate, you know, that we're in it together, whether this works. And I got to tell you, if I didn't play high school football, I don't know where I would have gotten that sort of sense of being on a team from. Um, because the work environment, it, it doesn't get nurtured all the time in that same way. Uh, but it's uh, so important to have that experience, to recognize that I'm responsible to you, you're responsible to me, and we're in it together. But the most important thing I want to pull additionally from what you said was the expectations. There is a clear time on when you're going to be available, when you're doing these things. There is actually a clear place to end the call on time, because that's another boundary, because today, especially if we have a one to two and you know, it might run over or whatever. 
then how do we prevent ourselves from running in the next one and missing our commitment to start with someone else? It's by getting the clarity and closure that you were talking about in that one meeting, which means setting aside the time at a given time mark and wherever you are executing on that and moving into the next thing because we really do have to manage our time and be respectful of the time of others. And that's a really big lesson that you've shared throughout the stories uh, that you've shared with us today. Well, Chris, so, learning that from sports was very easy. You know, this, in hockey and basketball, the game has to end because the team's got to get on the plane at a certain time or the plane don't take off. They don't get to the next city. They don't play the next game. So there's a lot of money involved in, in being on time, which meant we had this, you know, I used to write scripts for every so many games, each executive would have responsibility for the game time script or the game time intermission, or if it was my youth hockey intermission. So learning to write those game day scripts and knowing that lights out was at 731 and singer was at 733 and puck was dropped at 735. 735 was 735, not 738, not 740, not 750. If the Zamboni broke down on the ice, it was a big deal. And you have to have guys push it off and get the other Zamboni out to do the to resurface the ice next basketball sweeping the floors all that stuff is timed it doesn't just happen when the cute little girl in the sweeper outfit comes out between halftime at the new york knicks games yeah it's that's it's the planned. orchestration of that yeah and that and that's actually where leadership has really moved into that orchestration era of how right. do we get all these people moving together and when we're standing alone in our office or sitting alone at our home office, dining room table, or wherever it might be, it's real easy to forget about the other people and their lives out there. And if you can actually have that empathy for them and consider them in the same way you want them to consider you, I think it can be much more efficient. Um, but we are starting to run out of time. So my question for you here today before we go is, coming back to this next generation of workers, what sort of advice for the kids today who are getting a chance to maybe intern remotely or you know, who aren't gonna have the same sort of experiences sitting across from Andy or Aaron in the office and learning from them through that mentorship. What sort of advice do you have for them today of how they can learn some of these more traditional aspects of business and the soft skills that, that you've become so proficient at? First thing is respect what you, the people who've preceded you already know and have forgotten and have done better than you've ever done yet so that you can be better than them. That's the very first thing respect, learn from them, embrace what they've experienced, and understand that they probably made mistakes before they learned to do it right. People who don't make mistakes don't make decisions. And you have to make decisions and you learn from your mistakes. Everything I've done wasn't perfect, thank God, or I wouldn't be able to do what I can do because you learn from your actions and your reactions and your experience. So that's the very first thing. Second thing is take the time to listen. Third. Don't leave because, oh, your friends are going to the bar at five o'clock and you want to be with them when there's an important meeting. The number of nights I sat around in offices until eight, nine o'clock at night while the hockey game was going on upstairs in meetings because it wasn't my event. I was just the game I was going to be at and I had responsibility, but they could find me. But I would sit in other meetings learning made me better at a much younger age than people twice my age. So don't be afraid to to give up the social for the business because what you're gonna end up having is a much better time socially because you're gonna be more successful. Really, really good advice, looking to the long-term and understanding um, you know, those sorts of trade-offs that we have and uh, really excellent advice and great insights and always great to talk to you, Andy, and get into some more of these stories. Um, we're here at the top of the outer, so we're unfortunately out of time now, um, but really, again, great to catch catch up with you and catch some more of these insights and less. I'll share more of this stuff in the coming weeks when we cut up this interview into little snippets and snacks that we can share with others. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you more on Clubhouse and through other forums about this and, and many other topics. So thank you very much, Andy Abramson from Communicado. And also, what's the name of the new wine business you're developing? Wine Toria, W-I-N capital T-O-U-R-I-A. I'm starting that with my partner, Victoria Varela, it's not named after her. It just kind of takes off of that. So that, that's, It's really awesome. And uh, we've got a lot more to talk about wine still. as We'll we, talk uh, all about wine, and I'll come up to Incline Village because it's a short flight from Vegas. Oh, man, yeah. Reno's really quick. So hopefully we'll get to see you up here sometime soon and 
we'll all get our vaccinations and be happy and return to the global travel schedule that we were both fortunate to enjoy. Um, for everyone else out there, this is Chris Hewer from Remotely, joined today by Andy Abramson to talk about his lessons from the decades of working remotely, going back to when he was a PR intern for part of the Philadelphia Flyers back in the day. Um, really excited again. Thank you so much, Andy, for joining us. It's been Thanks, a pleasure. Chris. Take care.